I'm also on the Dummerston Conservation Commission. It's great that you came out to, to hear our dear friend David Sobel tonight. Um, as you know, Dummerston Conservation Commission does a series of workshops all throughout the year, usually once a month. Last month into early March, we did a series, four-part series on um, conservation genomics, which was fascinating. And all of our workshops are filmed by BCTV, so if you are not if you want to watch it again, or if you want to catch up on some of the programs that you might not have been able to attend, please go to our website or go to BCTV so that you can view them. As you probably know, the Conservation Commission uh, also sponsors uh, environmental education programs with BEAK at the Darston School, as well as wildlife inventories and a variety of other really, really great projects. So we're really glad you're here, and we're glad that you're here to support us. I am thrilled that David Sobel is here to uh, talk to us about wild play. Um, he, I've known David, I was trying to figure this out, since the late 1970s, was not too long ago, not too. when I was a graduate, school at Ant a, um, a graduate student at Antioch, and he was my teacher and my advisor. Um, what's remarkable was that 40 years ago, David was teaching and preaching the importance of nature and place-based education, of developing curriculum, games, programs to help children and adults understand the natural world around them, for them to feel at home in the woods and subsequently become ambassadors for the health of our ecosystem. 25 years before Richard Louvre coined nature deficit disorder, David was talking about this. What's amazing is that David continues to write and teach his message, which is rooted in, in our ancient soils and is always invigorating and fresh. His books, multiple books, you've probably read about them on our, on our poster um, and, and, and our press releases. His books are engaging, instructive, and prophetic. And he is sought after all over to give keynotes, to help design nature, preschools and kindergartens. He's a deep thinker and an inspiration to so many of us. He's chosen to talk tonight about his own adventures as a parent and an educator. And we are really, really lucky to have David with us tonight. That's right. Yeah. yeah I'm, I was just at a conference of, for nature-based early childhood in Miami about a week ago. And, um, and this whole movement to get kids connected with the natural world is not just a crunchy Vermont rural thing, but it's happening in inner city Miami with Hispanic and African American kids and in San Antonio and across the country. This is, there is a kind of a, a vibrant movement to kind of make sure we preserve kids' relationship with the natural world. I usually do talks that uh, focus on education and how we kind of need to make education more nature-based. Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about, I'm going to tell some parenting stories for the most part. I'm going to do a little bit of wraparound of theory, why are we talking about this stuff, why is it important, and then I'm going to tell some parenting stories. So the parenting stories are kind of self-indulgent, and I don't do it very often, so it's fun to have the opportunity. Um, and this, um, this is a picture of my son. Uh, having built a driftwood fort, actually not around here, but on a beach in Costa Rica. So when we talk about, when I use the term wild play, wild uh, refers to play in wild places, not out of control, chaotic play. Okay, so like, ah! that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. Okay, so things have changed a lot in the last 20 years. When a lot of us grew up, and I can say us, because our it, our kind of average age is probably about 60 if we take the younger folks and the older folks. Uh, so when we were growing up in the 40s and 50s and 60s, there, uh, the nature of childhood was different. And there's a great book by Robert Arbib called The Lord's Woods, um, when he describes his relationship with the landscape when he was nine years old in the 1940s. And he said, I was nine years old that June afternoon when we first discovered the Lord's woods and the world was unspoiled and filled with mysteries. My first two-wheeler, dark and red and fast, had come with my birthday, and ever since that glorious day, my world had been expanding. Only yesterday I had ventured beyond the edge of my universe, 
out beyond Westwood Road, where the endless green unknown of the forest spread before us. We will know it all, Carl and I. We will explore and conquer this America of ours. We will make this our private paradise. To know it and by knowing it, own it, and then go forth beyond our woodland bounds, answering the urgent beckonings of field and farm and road and stream. So I love that uh, phrase that he uses, urgent beckonings, because for, I'm pretty convinced that for kids right around that point, eight, nine or 10 years old, the landscape calls to them if they're in a place where they can have a landscape around them that's explorable. Uh, uh, I have another quote, which I'm not going to read, that's from Annie Dillard. Annie Dillard grew up in Pittsburgh and describes the same experience of exploring, ur of exploring neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. So it's, it wasn't just a rural thing. If you lived in a city, you wanted, you had that tendency to kind of, let's go figure out what's around the next bed, what's on the next block, that kind of thing. So there's this inherent desire to get out and understand the world. So today, things are really different. So this is from a parenting magazine article about 10 or 15 years ago. And this is a mom describing her relationship to her own kids, saying, I want to stand in the front yard and sing out their lovely names, meaning the names of her own kids, uh, and have them suddenly appear in the damp yard around me like little fireflies, but I can't, I can't let them roam. I don't have any, my mother's confidence that the world is a safe place. Uh, and then something irreplaceable has been lost. The golden age of childhood is gone. So it was, a, it was a big part of my intention to preserve the golden age of childhood for my own kids. You know, so I was kind of thinking, I was doing this at an educational level and I was kind of a developmental psychologist thinking about it theoretically, but I was also really trying to figure out, okay, how do I honor the urgent beckonings part of my kids' desire to be out in the world? And it's really hard to do that at a time when all these things are happening. So the increased digitalization of kids' lives, uh, the fact that there are so many structured activities for kids, and the fact that there are working mothers or working, two working parents or, uh, you know, or um, kids in after school programs so that it's, children have less free time to be out exploring. There's also this fear of injuries you know, there's now this sense that, okay, we can't let the kids go outside or we can't let the kids be in the woods because they're gonna get injured. The counterpoint to that is that there's about 8,000 kids a year injured by falling flat screen televisions, <laughs> right? And that kids show up, a kid shows up in an emergency room every some uh, minutes, every 10 minutes or something like that around the United States for falls on stairs. Right. Stairs are dangerous, right? Stairs are more dangerous. Stairs and falling flat screen televisions are more dangerous than being in the woods. But we've come to think that, you know, being in the woods is too dangerous. I'm not going to talk about the whole stranger danger. Right? So instead of the freedom to roam that Roger, that Robert Arbib described in that first quote, you've got instead kids on short leashes and soon we'll just you know, soon we'll just put a little tracking device underneath their skin, and so you'll be able to find, basically that's with cell phones, essentially, you've got that, the tracking device in here. But what we want is more the freedom to roam, rather than the tight, tight ring. And so the problem here is that, uh, this is from a wonderful book and an article uh, by this uh, child psychologist, uh, known as Edith Cobb, and she said there's this special period in the middle age of childhood from about five or six to 11 or 12 when the natural world is experienced in some highly evocative way, producing in the child a sense of some profound continuity with natural processes. So from five or six to 11 or 12, there's this biological predisposition to bond with the natural world. And what we do, uh, what we tend to do is just the opposite. When kids get to be about six, we put them inside for six hours of the day. 
and then we and then after school we make sure that they're in programs so that they don't have any opportunity to be outside. So that there's this so it's we're kind of operating in conflict with this natural disposition. Now this is a really interesting uh, map of four generations of range in a British family. So range is how far a kid can go on their own volition without parents. So in 1919, the great grandfather George could walk, could go from his home here down to the Rother Valley about six miles to go fishing. So on his own, when he's eight years old, he could travel six miles. The grandfather, eight in 1950, could walk about a mile on his own into the woods. The mother, aged eight in 1979, could walk to the swimming pool about a half a mile away. And the son, aged eight in about 10 years ago, could walk on his own to the end of the street. So over the course of that four generations, you can see this collapsing of the kid's world. So no more freedom to roam. Now, even more interesting is that the same thing happened in Wilmington, Vermont. I don't know if anybody knows Roger Hart, who was a developmental psychologist who did a study of children's geography in Wilmington in the 1970s. And then, and so he actually studied kids' ranges. You know, we had, we, he kind of studied kid, how far kids could travel from their house. He interviewed parents. Uh, he went back about, I think it was about six or seven years ago now, and looked at what, the, what was happening in Wilmington, Vermont now. And the, exactly the same thing had happened that I illustrated in that previous slide. But it had happened just over the course of the last 40 years. And even more interesting was that the kids who were the kids that he studied in the 60s and 70s were the parents who wouldn't allow their kids to roam, right? So here are these kids who had grown up having this experience. You would presume that they would be parents that would allow their kids to do this, but they weren't. So what's happened is that this, uh, there's been this infection of fear as the result, a lot of people speculate, of massive amount being saturated by media stories of childhood abductions and all the problems and dangers that kids can face. So we are saturated with media with a fear that's disproportionate to the actual danger that kids are in. Uh, so if it's happened in Wilmington, it's probably happened here. Uh, so this was what this is what I've been this is what I've been trying to struggle against with, with my own kids. So actually, it's not. I'm not going to read. Yeah, I'll read ISDPS. This is to say, okay. So what was Vermont child look like, like you know, in the 18 in the late 1800s? So this woman, Ida Clavinus, who was growing up in Callis said, uh, in the winter, our favorite sport was coasting. The skating season was short, as it usually snowed as soon as the mill pond froze over. We made the most of it while it lasted, the boys building a fire on the island so we could get warm. Think about that. The boys building a fire on the island. Right? The 10-year-old boys out building the fire on the island. I don't think so. But coasting was something else. We coasted from the first day of the first snow um, we started up on East Hill, almost up to the cemetery, and coasted down into the village a good quarter of a mile. Uh, so that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, thing that ought to be a Vermont kid's birthright. Here's another version of this. This is from a great book called The Tata Weenie Club. <laughs> about, written by a, guy, a Vermont storyteller growing up in Richmond in the 70s. He says, we had family, friends, and neighbors, and we went outside and did things with them. We entertained ourselves by doing things that involved physical activity. I could leave the house in the morning and be home by dusk, and nobody would issue an Amber Alert. 
We made stuff. We made tunnels in the Hamo and snowbanks, built tree forts and snow forts. We made swings from rafters, trees, and vines. We climbed trees just for the fun of it. We went hunting and fishing. We rode our bikes, horses, ponies, and even pigs and cows. We got in apple fights, snowball fights, mud ball fights, cow flop fights, right, and so on. So I'm contending that this, this is inherently good stuff, and this is what's fading as the world gets digitalized. Now, before I start talking about my own kids, I want to uh, give you another perspective. Where are we? Oh. Okay. So there are uh, two interesting uh, studies that I'm going to talk about really briefly. One called a study of the religious experience of childhood and the other one's called spiritual and inspirational experiences of childhood. And essentially they were study, one's a British study, one's an American study. They don't reference each other, which is actually interesting. And uh, they, were, they solicited examples from the public. But it was often, I think in both cases, they, there was a solicitation in a newspaper that says, tell us about some experience, let's see what it was. Uh, tell us about some experience where you felt that your life had in some way been affected by some power beyond yourself. So it was, it was a generic provocation or a prompt that asked people to talk about uh, spiritual experiences. In both cases, about 20% of the responses, talk, the, uh, the people talked about spiritual experiences in the natural world. Uh, and there was no suggestion in the prompt that this had anything, that this should have anything to do with nature. Uh, and, the, uh, and the examples that they got back are fascinating. There's a majority of the examples that come from in between uh, when kids were 6 and 11 or 12, the same period of time that we were just talking about before. And they talk about this sense of profound continuity and that quote from Edith Cobb. So I'm going uh, to read you one. Uh, so these were all older people, so you know, people in their 40s and 50s talking about memories from being 10, 11, 9, 10, 11. So this one woman said, when I was about 11, I spent part of the summer in the Y Valley, uh, waking up early one morning. I left my bed, went to kneel on the window seat to look out over the river just below the house. The scene was very beautiful, and quite suddenly I felt myself on the verge of a great revelation. It was as if I had stumbled unwittingly on a place where I was not expected, and was about to be initiated into some wonderful mystery, something of indescribable significance, and then just as suddenly the feeling faded. But for the few seconds while it lasted, I had known that in some strange way, I, the essential me, was a part of the trees, of the sunshine, and the river, that we all belonged to some great unity. I was left filled with exhilaration and exultation of spirit. This is one of the most memorable experiences of my life, of a quite different quality and greater intensity than the sudden lift of the spirit one may often feel when confronted with beauty in nature. So that the quote there, so, she, so remember I, the quote from Edith Cobb on the natural world is experienced in some highly evocative way. That's what we're getting at. Uh, and the child appears to, this is Edith Cobb still, the child appears to experience a discontinuity and a continuity. Discontinuity meaning oneness with the world. Discon uh, what, con no, continuity being at one with the world, discontinuity being separate from the world. And so it's right around this 10 years old when kids have the capacity to both have, have the ego and be separate and cognizant, but also feel you know, merged, with the, merged with the universe. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. So this is the quote from, that I just read. For those brief seconds, I had known that in some strange way, I, the essential me, so I, the essential me, that's the discontinuity, was a part of the trees of the sunshine, part of some great unity. 
So uh, I'm going to read other, I could read other examples of these spiritual memories in which uh, adults say, I had this experience and st starting right around 12 or 13, my ability to have that feeling of oneness went away. I couldn't have it anymore and I couldn't ever get back to that feeling of oneness. So my contention is that by allowing the kids to have the free roaming in the landscape, we are setting up the possibility for these transcendent experiences and that there's a direct correlation between the transcendent experiences and an environmental ethic. Right? That if you, are, if you have this feeling of oneness with the world, then you will protect the natural world. So by cutting kids off from the opportunity to have those experiences, we're undercutting the future, you know, the possible future of environmental stewards. And so my contention is you know, that one transcendent nature experience is worth a thousand nature facts. So that what we really want is the, the experiential opportunity rather than this is a red maple, this is a sugar maple, you know, here's the cambium, here's the xylem. Now, all that stuff is going to happen, but you have to kind of allow for the primacy of the experience. Here, this is the question. I, which, I haven't decided which slide I want to use. For one transcendent experience is worth a thousand nature facts. There's two different images. Which one is better? The, this little one, the kid on the bridge, or this one that's a little bit kind of you have to give me feedback because for future reference, I have to decide which slide I want to use. The second one, he's alone. Yeah. So I don't know whether that's oh. significant or not. But which one? Which one's more evocative to you? Do I, this one's more. This one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. I think they're, 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 it's more gleeful. Yeah. But the second one is is much is like meditative and right. Right. Uh, transcendent in the and it's also. You can't quite, you see them from the back, you can't right. see what's in front of them. Right. So, I, so, it depends upon whether you want to be a doer or a beer. Oh, this is yeah. a beer, oh. the other is a doer. That's, so do you know that, just the kind of that graffiti that you find in bathroom stalls? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to, is it to do, do is to, to be? be. Who, who is Kant. Kant, to do is to be? To, to, to be, to do, um, Socrates. Socrates, dooby dooby doo, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> We've been in the same bathroom. <laughs> I think we should keep them both. Yeah. They're both transcendent experiences. Yeah, so I like that. Okay. captures the fact that they're not all the same, you know? Okay, so, okay. so now a few, a few parenting experiences. So I was intent on trying to provide my kids with this, these experiences. Now, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna do early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence. I'll do a story from each. Um, and um, my goal in early childhood was empathy, that kind of sense of oneness, connectedness with animals in the natural world. My goal in middle childhood, so early childhood, up to five or six or seven. In middle childhood, five or six to 11 or 12, my goal was exploration. Right, kind of the kind of examples we've been talking about. And then my goal in adolescence was the beginning of a social conscience and, but also initiation experiences. Uh, and so I'm gonna give you an example of each of these things uh, because I felt like that was, all, those were all the steps in terms of creating an environmental ethic. So the first story comes from when my son is about three years old and uh, we're trying to get him from uh, waking up in the middle of the night, wanting to crawl in bed with my wife and I. And so, um, I'm, so I'm in a room with him in a crib and just me and the mom is not around. Uh, so he wakes up at about four o'clock in the morning screaming. This was like a really rare experience. You know, it was kind of like he was, he was absolutely uh, horrified about something. And I get him to come down and he says, he says, deer inside, deer inside, deer in the living room, I'm scared. Um, and you know, he was kind of like, he was shaking. I said, 
no Eli, there's no deer in sight, it's okay, there's nothing to be afraid of. Now, if you understand from a child psychology dream point of view, that's the worst response, right? Denying the dream experience is like counterproductive, doesn't help. He says, deer in sight, deer in sight, deer go away. I said, yes, it went outside. So, you know, you want to take the dream experience and go with it. Uh, Eli says, deer go in woods? I said, yep, deer ran away into the woods. He said, Eli says, bad guys scare deer away? Deer don't come back? I said, nope, he's not coming back. And then he said, feel better now. And then he went back to sleep. <laughs> the next night, he, uh, the next night, we actually, he had a wolf t-shirt, which he wore to bed that night. But before that happened, so we talked about the dream at breakfast, and it was clear from his voice that this was still really on his mind. This was, that Jung talks about big dreams, this was a big dream, right? That had some special significance for him. And so I knew that I needed to do something with the dream. And at the same, at the same time going on in our family, I, was, I had uh, committed myself to a family storytelling experience where when the kids would say, Daddy, tell us a story, I would tell them a story. And I would tell them a story based on some recent experience that had gone on in their lives or you know something that was current so i was trying to cultivate this capacity to make stories up on the spot or i would start to fabricate them and then gradually i got into continuous storytelling so i knew with this story that, that with the dream that i had to do something with it so the next evening when he crawled up on my lap on the couch he said tell me a story i told him this story he says, Daddy, tell me a story. So one night, in the middle of the night, the little boy woke up. He heard a strange thumpy noise. Was it his father turning over in bed nearby? No, his father was snuggled under the quilt. He heard the thumpy noise again. A big, dark deer with spreading antlers stared at the little boy. I scared, whispered the little boy. He tried to cry. He wished his father would wake up. The deer spoke to him in a soft and warm voice. Don't be afraid, little boy. I won't hurt you. The deer lifted his legs up to his head and, and kind of twisted off the antlers and laid them down on the floor. He says, I'm a friendly deer. The deer crossed the room and stood by the little boy's crib. Quietly, quietly, climb on my back. Don't wake your daddy from his deep sleepy nap. And so the deer leaned over and the little boy grabbed, to put his arms around the deer's neck and he climbed up on top of the deer. And the deer said, hold on tight with all your might. And they bounded out of the door and down the road. Down the road into the woods on the trail to the falls. The deer's hooves splushed in the mud by the, mud by the little stream, but the little boy stayed warm and dry up high on the deer's back. The deer sipped a drink at the waterfall and bounded on, onto a trail the boy had never walked on, onto a cathedral of pines by the edge of the lake. They stopped where the moonlight streamed off the water. The boy felt the deer panting beneath him. Slipping his legs over to one side, he dropped down to the ground, and there were a mother deer and two fawns. Children, here's your wish, a friend to play with, said the father deer. And the little boy followed the fawns to a big pile of leaves in the woods. They bounced in the pile, leaves scattered everywhere. They tickled and giggled, leaves crunched in their hair. They ran back to the mother and father deer, and they said, Daddy, can we keep him? <laughs> but the little boy thought of riding in the truck with his father and taking a bath with his mom and jumping on the couch with his sister, and he felt sad. I miss my family. I want to go home. And so the mother deer licked his nose. He climbed up on her back, down the path through the woods, past the waterfall falling, up the hill to the house to his family, all asleep. And the mother deer brought him back inside, placed him in the crib, and he said, can you come in the crib with me? And so the mother deer gets in the crib with him, 
and snuggles with him and he falls asleep and then she leaves. And in the morning, the sister of the little boy comes downstairs and she says, why are there deer prints on the floor? Right? And that's the end of the story. <laughs> so, uh, so that was the beginning of a story series in which the boy would leave, uh, would leave the house at night and go join the deer in the woods. And eventually it got to the point where he could, there was a little portal where he could pass through the portal and he would become a deer. And then they would have deer adventures. And the deer adventures, you know, meant, you know they would kind of run into a porcupine and somebody would get quills in their nose and then there would be hunters and they would have to hide from the hunters. So there was this whole series of becoming deer. And at one point, um, they got wrapped up and it was kind of had, there was a Cinderella motif, so you had to be back uh, through the portal by a certain time or you wouldn't be able to turn back into a little boy. You'd been stuck as a deer. So they raced back, they kind of made it to the portal and he made it almost all the way through, but not quite. And he was left with a deer tail. That little white, you know, white tailed deer, a little white tail. So, uh, so that's where the story ended. We were driving home in the truck. We got to the, pulled up in the driveway. That was the end of the story. And he said, "Oh, tell some more of the story." And I said, "No, later on." So, the boy in the story has been left. You know, the little boy is back, but he's got a deer's tail. Uh, so we're walking inside, and I remember f from the morning that, that my, uh, the cat had, uh, had caught a chipmunk and there had been a chipmunk tail <laughs> lying on the patio, which I had picked up and put on the table that was on the patio. So we're walking inside, I grab the chipmunk tail, I uh, tuck it into the back of his belt, right? <laughs> Without him knowing it. Without him knowing it. We walk inside and his sister obligingly says, Eli, how come you have a tail, right? And he whips around, sees the tail, and it was one of those moments where it was, uh, it was, uh, he could not, he did not know what was real, right? Is it all of a sudden the story, the story reality and the, and the everyday reality had come together. And this was something I did a lot. I consciously started to cultivate where I was trying to draw together story reality and, wake, and waking reality with the kids. Um, and my intention was, to, was out that kind of sense, that sense of profound continuity is that I wanted story and everyday reality to merge together and I wanted the kids to feel like they could become animals. And they could, and then they could not become animals. I wanted that sense of being able to inhabit animals' bodies. Um, and yeah, so that happened in a lot of different ways. A lot of people think I tell that story, and a lot of people think that's you're lying to the children, right? And in fact, <clears throat> I think what you're doing is you're creating uh, this easy pathways between. Um, uh, uh, reality as it is and reality as it could be and you want them to have the capacity to move from reality as it is to reality as it could be. You want that sense of imagination and magic. Uh, and so you have that capacity in middle childhood. By the time you get to six or seven, that merging of story and reality is not there for kids anymore. Um, so you have to take advantage of it in early childhood. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, to middle childhood. So this is now um, Eli is about nine, and um, I'm have all those same fears that we've talked that were referred to before. You know, down the road from where we live, it's a bunch of kind of young guys in their 20s, living in a house, they all have big pickup trucks, they drink a lot, they drive up and down the road pretty fast, uh, you know, having drunk a lot, and I'm anxious about that. 
uh, but we also live in a great place where basically out the back door is, explore, is explorable woods, just like the Lord's Woods. There's a great hemlock gorge. It's, it's very similar to Dunderstone. So I really, so I'm always anxious about them being out there by themselves, but I also know that the virtue of being out there by themselves is greater than the potential risk that they are subject to. So it's, a, it's late November, there's been an early snow so that this big brush pile that I've been collecting, I could burn. And so Eli joins me to start burning this brush pile. And then in the middle, middle of the afternoon, and then he disappears for about a couple of hours. Some friend of his comes over, and the kids, they're, they're both gone for two or three hours. And that was, we were okay with, uh, okay, we don't know where they are, but they're going to be okay. Uh, after a couple, two or three hours, it's now nighttime. It's now nighttime. There's a, I think there's a half moon. The fire has been burning all afternoon, so it's really warm. So we're, he comes back and we're in our shirt sleeves, even though it's cold. And he's helped with kind of folding the ends into the brush pile. And he tells this story. He says, Daddy, I found a whole new part of the neighborhood today. I've lived here nine years, and it's amazing that I've never found this place. But now I've got five more years to keep exploring it. It's really interesting that he said five more years because the five more years is the end of the early, uh, the middle childhood phase, right? Middle childhood kind of ends right around 13 or 14. So why, where he came up with the five years thing, I don't know. Uh, he said, I found a bunch of pine trees growing all close together, eight different groups of little pine trees. And so we picked one group out and then we climbed all the trees in that group, about seven or eight. He says, you know at the beginning how the trunk is smooth then there's a bunch of branches, and then it's smooth, and then there's another bunch of branches, right? So he's talking about white pines, right? Those whirls of branches. So, uh, so Yashka and I, Yashka's his friend, laid back on the seventh bunch, bunch of branches. You know, they're probably up about 10 or 10, 12 feet up above the ground. And we rested, and I shut my eyes, and I felt like I was going to fall asleep, but I didn't. And I was daydreaming about little pathways and walkways through the trees. Like in the Star Wars movie where the Ewoks have that little village all up in the trees with suspended bridges connecting the houses together. Do you remember that? The Ewok village up in the trees? Or the way the, or the, way the squirrels make a pathway from one tree to the next. And then I woke up and I thought, hey, that's not just a dream. Maybe I can really do that right here. So I tried it. First you get up on one of the tall pine trees and then you walk out on one of the long branches, and then you hop onto a long branch on another tree. He said, we're up about 10 feet off the ground. We could zigzag from one tree to another tree to another tree. And then I sat down on one of the branches and I slid down bump, 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 bump on each of the branches until I hit the ground. It was so much fun. And I'm kind of thinking, oh my God. <laughs> Is it, you know, I'm allowing my kid to go out there and he's gonna break his neck, right? And clearly, he had had a great time, and nothing was broken. And so I thought, okay, well, I didn't respond by saying, no, you can't do that without an adult. You're not supposed to, you know, that kind of thing. I said, okay, I said, that's cool. And then he kept going, and he said, up until now, I didn't feel comfortable exploring the neighborhood because it felt like I was going to get lost. Now I want to know the whole neighborhood really well so that I can make a perfect map of it. I want to know it just as well as I know all the houses along the road. I'm a good explorer because I really look at all the details, all the little places you can go, all the crannies you can find. I don't just look at it and go. I spend a lot of time on it and make forts and traps and stuff. <laughs> um, and so this was, and, and there was other examples of this. I was re also really into, um, cold water immersion in every month of the year, right? So and it was something I was, did with the kids a lot. So the idea was you had to get in the water every month, you know, in, in New Hampshire. The only thing that I, uh, the, uh, the only thing that was, uh, was uh, the only concession was that you could wear neoprene wetsuit booties because the hardest part is the walking on the icy shore to get down into the water. And so, uh, 
we only managed to do this about three or four years where we, you know, every, it's only really hard in December and January. Actually, December is actually can be pretty easy. It's more like January and February, the two hardest months to manage it. Uh, I remember coming back from skiing somewhere and on January 6th and going in at the, it's the, is it the Green Bridge? I think it's the, the metal bridge, right? Where's there's a little place to swim at the at base the of the bridge? What? At the covered bridge. Yeah, it's at the covered bridge. I remember on January 6th once going in because it was kind of a warm January day and I could get in the water right there. And so I, I came home from work one day when my daughter was about 12 years old. She said, Daddy, I got February today. And she had gone by herself that mile back into the woods to a reservoir behind our house where there's a place where the water runs through a sluice so the water stays unfrozen. It had been about 29 degrees. It had been kind of lightly raining or sleeting. She went back there with the dog and she went for a swim you know, in, you know, on some February afternoon, and I'm thinking, oh man, <laughs> you know, this is like, this is really dangerous, right? Uh, and, uh, and again, she was fine, so I kind of tolerated it. Uh, so this whole allowing kid, you know, allowing children to be let go and have those experiences that allow them to bond with the world. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two different rites of passage. Um, so in all kind of traditional cultures, uh, at adolescence, 12 or 13, uh, there's a rite of passage, and the rite of passage involves some isolation from the adult, from the social group, training, with adults in the secrets, the secret wisdom and knowledge, and often wilderness hardship, and then reintegration into the social group. And when you leave, you're a child, and when you come back, you're an adult. And the structures of uh, rites of passage are really similar across very disparate and different cultures. And disparate, different cultures that had no react in a relationship with each other. In other words, the, st the structure of the rite of passage must be biologically predetermined because, it, because the same traditions emerged in different cultural places. So therefore, I wanted to make sure that uh, my kids had rite of passage experiences. So, uh, Trying to figure out which I'm going to talk about first. We'll do this first. Uh, this was uh, this was uh, my daughter went to the Waldorf school in Keene, and the uh, the sixth grade the classroom teacher understood rites of passage, and so one of the things that she did with her kids was take the kids caving. And they did a really serious caving thing, you know, with under underground for three or four hours, wading through water up to their, uh, you know, up to their shoulders in depth. And um, it was a, it was a very, it was a rite of passage kind of experience. And I love this quote from her after this experience. She said, I feel so enlightened, like a new self, like there's new parts of myself I discovered. I never knew I could do all that stuff. You don't even know how to explore those places and then chances come and you actually get to do it. It opens up a whole new world, like a cavern of darkness that someone has shown a light on. I knew I could bike and run, but I never knew how wild my world was right here in my own backyard of New England. So the way in which the kind of the going into the new, to, to the dark, into a new place also gives her access to some new place in herself. So she went on. Uh, you know, Croca Expeditions in Marlowe does rites of passage experiences. And it's, and it's important in rites of passage experiences that the kids, that you don't do it with your adult, with your parents. You do it with, sometimes with other adults, sometimes with other boys of your own age. Uh, so she did one, this was, uh, this was like a week long experience. And at the beginning, when you drop your daughter off, uh, they give you a long piece of yarn and your daughter holds one end of the yarn and you hold the other end of the yarn and then one of the leaders comes and snips the yarn 
And so it's symbolic of the separation that's going to happen. And uh, they spent about a week up on a, uh, in an isolated campsite up near Somerset Reservoir and did this uh, variety of uh, kind of challenging and stressful experiences. Uh, you know, they'd go into bogs and they'd kind of slip through the sphagnum moss into the bog and get completely muddy and then they would walk a mile to the Somerset Reservoir and get washed off and they, cre they did um, sweat lodges, you know, they built sweat lodges and did a sweat. And my daughter said it was kind of one of the hardest things she's ever done. And I remember one night, one afternoon while she's out there, there was this series of really uh, uh, violent microbursts that came across southern Vermont. And I could imagine, I'm sitting in my office thinking of her out in the woods when this is happening. And she said, you know, they were crouched on top of their packs, uh, hoping that they were not going to get struck by lightning. So it was a, it was a very vivid experience for her. Uh, when you, at the end, when you come back, the, um, the girl has taken the two pieces of yarn and woven it into a new piece of weaving to signify that they've taken the relationship with the parent and, brought, and made it into something new that was you know, part of herself. And then she had this, uh, you know, they did things like this, you know. There was face painting and, you know, making clan crowns and when they found dead animals, they do burial rituals. I'm gonna get to that one in a second. So at the, at, in her journal, in relationship to this uh, rite of passage experience. She said, looking up at the sky through the foliage, I realize that my life is a truly precious and beautiful thing. I want to kindle its spark, bring it to flame, and if I can, bring it to a roaring fire of happiness, which will not be stomped out or extinguished in any unnatural way so that it may burn down to the last ember, which will then quietly, happily sleep, which will then quietly, happily slip into the blissful and endless sleep of death. <laughs> How old is she? She's, she's 13, right? And so clearly the, this experience had, had that kind of, you know, it gave her that kind of Buddhist revelation sense of you know the value of life and the acceptance of death um, at some point uh, which is exactly the kind of, that's you know that's that's the kind of message that kids are supposed to get during these rite of passage experiences uh, with my son we did something this was more of an afternoon thing and i did this with five boys uh, who were all about 12 or 13. So it was three different boys from three different families. And I convinced the other parents to let me do this with the boys. And everybody was kind of, you know, a little nervous about it. So I took them to, I took, I designed this, uh, this adventure challenge that they had to do, which involved uh, uh, canoeing and bicycling and then bushwhacking and, and uh, you know, pathfinding in the woods. And so, uh, if you, any of you know southern New Hampshire, this is New Manuset. And I started them here. So I gave them, they had two canoes, and they had a map. And they had to follow the map to get back to the home of one of, a couple of the boys. So they had to paddle from here up to here, and then portage over into Spoonwood, and then paddle down Spoonwood, and then right off of this point, there was a, 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 a treasure snack uh, that was on the bottom of the lake. So I gave them you know, directions for how to find it, and they had snorkels and masks. So they had to dive to find the snack that was right out about here. So then they continued on, then they had to portage across here, and then uh, end here and leave the canoes right here. 
So this boom would move into your big lakes. You know, it can blow up and get pretty wavy, and, and their parents are thinking, or they can, you know, what's going to happen? What are we going to do if something happens to them? And I said, you know, they're going to figure it out. So then, you know, there we go. It was a lot of, I had to reassure the parents that this is good. We're going to let them do this, and they're going to figure it out. So then, from the end of, of so here's the end of the lake. They had to stash the canoes here, and then there were bicycles waiting for them here. And they had to bicycle from here, down here, down this way, up this way. This is an old woods road down here. Second, second snack treasure that they had to find using a compass bearing over in the woods in here. They got to here, they dropped the bikes off here, and they had to come up to here, and then they had to figure it they had to do follow compass bearings and find their way across to this hilltop, which is where the parents' house was. So it took them about you know three or four hours to do this, and you know the parents said, "Well, should we should we check on them at some point?" And I said, "Nope, we're not doing anything. We're going to figure it all out by themselves." Uh, and it was it was one of the and then there was a fire and a kind of them talking about the adventures and talking about. Of significant experiences from their childhoods, and it had the same kind of ex it had the same kind of effect for them as it had for my daughter, that they were trusted to go and figure this stuff out. Yeah, so there, that's the bushwhacking part of the experience. Yeah, so we're gonna get back to that. So, so the big idea here is that. And this is what the Wild Playbook is about. And if you're interested, I have a couple of copies of the Wild Playbook if anybody's interested. The idea is that the challenge, the parent, the, the challenge for the parent or the grandparent or educators is to understand this developmental trajectory and that what kids need in relationship to the natural world in early childhood is different from what they need in middle childhood and it's different from what they need in adolescence. And if we can understand what those biological needs are in terms of the development of the self and the development of environmental responsibility, if we, if we can follow that trajectory and support it, then we're going to have uh, kids that grow up to be adults that want to be environmental stewards and want to serve on conservation commissions and want to recycle and want to do all those things. And so that was my goal, is to have them become adults that were you know, committed to saving the environment and to appre and loving and appreciating the environment. So and when my daughter was about 20 years old, she wrote me a letter. She wrote her, and her, me and her mom a letter. And she said, this connection to the earth, which is everywhere and always nurturing, is one of the greatest gifts I have ever received. She was talking about all the different ways in which we had cultivated, allowed her relationship with the natural world. It allows me to feel at home anywhere that I can plant my feet in the soil and hug the trees, and it helps me to find solitude and peace within myself and the world around me. So it was, it was one of those kind of break your heart, tear up kind of things where it kind of confirmed that what I had been trying to do had actually worked. And this was, you know, of her own volition. Nobody asked her to write this. The, the flip side of that is that, um, you know, when you cultivate this sense of, uh, of adventure and risk taking and initiative in the natural world, it can have, it will have consequences. So this is, what, this is what my son currently does. Oh no, there's both my son and my daughter. This is what my son currently does. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and this. So that's him about to go over about a 30 foot waterfall in his kayak. Uh, so I feel, sometimes I feel like I've created a monster, you know, <laughs> he's kind of, he's like a high risk sport kid. Uh, but on the other hand, he's really, he's kind of, he is at one with the world. So, that's my story.
My daughter is a theater director, but still, but an ardent natural world enthusiast. So, but she went, um, we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of uh, interesting theater with the kids when they were young too. So that was something else. Like there, my daughter was really into uh, the Moss Flower books. So you author of those books, Red, the Red Wall series. You know, there we, we did, there we did, we often did theater, birthday theater adventures where we would recreate certain stories that my daughter was really into that involved adventures in the wood and slaying dragons and um, having to follow maps to get places. But she said that a lot of her, her, a lot of her interest in theater directing came out of a lot of these theater adventures that we did in the woods. So, yeah. I'm thinking about this whole idea of different stages and how you know, the early childhood, that whole imaginative mm -hmm. um, magic play. And I remember when I, teach, I taught middle, in that, those middle ages, right. um, it, it seemed like the kids that had those kinds of experiences when they were young <coughs> were able to hold on to that for a little bit yeah. longer. Yeah. And so that their imaginative play, they were really in that right. scene that they right. created. It's also, it's interesting that I talk sometimes uh, about paracosmic play. Paracosmic play is, uh, kids play is extended, elaborated fantasy play that some kids do in middle childhood into, into adolescence a little bit. And so um, it's where kids create a fantasy and they play it and they play it over and over again and extends it over a long period of time and, they, and the characters have history and sometimes they'll map it. And Narnia was a, was a childhood paracosm for C.S. Lewis and his brother. And uh, Edith Wharton had a paracosm. And it turns out that a lot of uh, adults that grow up to be novelists actually in, were involved in this elaborate paracosmic play in some kind of natural setting a lot of the times when they were kids. And so I say, this is another, for instance, of, you know, of taking a natural developmental phenomenon and supporting it. You know, so I think really good teachers create paracosms in classrooms or develop elaborated stories. So I'd have a story, a novel that I've written that was based on a story that I told my kids for about five years one really long story. And um, they were the, you know, there were characters in the story that resembled them. And, um, and we would, you know, I would weave in experiences, dreams and experiences that would happen in everyday life, like the dear dreams got woven into this story. And so I have this conviction that family, family storytelling is one of these great things you can do with your kids. And family storytelling, it's, embedded in the natural world is even better. It's interesting that this phenomenon tends to be dads and kids rather than moms and kids. There's different things that moms do, but the family storytelling thing is one thing that dads do. Yeah, uh, we have a situation at camp, some of you know I run Green Mountain Camp, yeah. and uh, the, we have a fairy forest, and for years, um, many of these girls will carry on from one year to the next. Yes, the story the, that they've started the, same the year story before. From the previous summer, yep, right? they pick yeah. up where they left off. The fairies have names. They know exactly where their, their fairy house was from the year before. They'll look for remnants. How did it survive the winter? Um, it's really interesting to me to see that that even though in the real world, at school, they would not be caught dead, right. being on the ground building fairy houses, and yet up until they're you know, 10, 11, 12, and beyond, right. they, it's a place where it's safe for them to do that, yeah. and, and they want to embrace that kind of magic. Right. It's really interesting to me. And sometimes they'll say to you, I'm just doing it for the little kids. Right. They're right there doing right. it, you know? <laughs> so it is interesting that they, I think there's a part of them that doesn't want to let it go right. when they get to that. So then, so then another interesting <laughs> phenomenon is, um, is doll funerals. And so some girls 
when they get to the end of like, well, this is not really cool anymore for me to be doing that, you know, to be making fairy houses or to be having dolls, is that uh, some girls will take one of their dolls, uh, they'll pack up all their dolls in a box, put it in the closet, they'll take one of the dolls, they'll take it to out into the woods, often to the place that has been their special place or den or fort, and they will have a doll <coughs> funeral. They will bury the doll, um, you know, literally bury the doll and have a funeral, and it, and it signifies the end of childhood and the beginning of adolescence. And kids will, of their own volition, construct this as a, you know, as a ritual transition. So it's kids, it's kids constructing the ritual rite of passage when the culture isn't providing it, right? So yes, being able to su supporting it is a great, is a really valuable thing. I was, Did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking a lot, you know, my daughter. Yeah. And I, I had, well, five kids, and two of them, well, they, all when they were very young, I don't know why I ever let them do this, they would go wandering out in the woods in back of our house and sleep overnight. Yeah. From the time right. they were little, little kids. And if, other, and if, uh, and if it was happening now, mm -hmm. other parents, People would be so disapproving of you. They would be reporting. Yes, that's right. Yes. And look how, I mean, I think about how they've turned out. My daughter still, at, when she's 57, in November, December, gee, I had, to, I had to brush all the snow off my tent so I could sleep in the woods last night. She's still sleeping out there. A lot of, she's probably back out there tonight, I don't know. She's, she's always sleeping in the woods. She's always roaming around in the woods. It's become her whole life. Yeah. And of, of the five, that's really, two of them are really invested in everything right. natural. Right. When she was in college, she spent a whole summer living off on a mountain, built herself a longhouse. Really? By herself? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, she had some interactions with right. the world, and we knew where she was, but... Um, but yes, this is, if you don't know, this is Patty Smith from Beak, who's I, one of the great naturalists in this area. Yeah, so she's it's stayed with her all her life, her, but her, her brother is a farmer, but he's right. very much the same. So right. Goes wandering out. Looking for things. All right. So it sounds like there's a there's a there's a combination of this of allowing to roam, this replay allowing right. to roam, and also helping to construct these experiences. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There has to, there's a lot. We did a lot of setting, you know, of enabling or scaffolding right. of experiences for the kids. So. So it's the combination, the, in the research that looks at this stuff, it's the combination of the access to play in wild places and the adult who modeled uh, environmental values. So that's what we need, yeah. I had no adult models, but as a kid I grew up on a 100 acre farm and the New York Central train ran through the farm as well. Wow. And I knew, going back to the train tracks, that I should be very aware right. of any hobos right. or <laughs> that just don't be seen right. while you're there. But um, I would be gone most of the day, and yep. meal time, I could still hear the the bell mm -hmm. right. and would reappear after and I would go, you know, all the way down to the Kalamazoo River and then come back. Right. Yeah, that's that's not the reality for a lot of kids now, for most kids this, these days. Mm -hmm. And it's not and as I might have said about the Wilmington Vermont, Wilmington Vermont is not any uh, more dangerous now yeah. than it was forty years ago. So I say the only thing that might have changed is probably more ticks than there were four years ago. Right. <laughs> but for the most part, it's not any more dangerous. But the the fear of not you know fear of allowing your kid to do that is much greater. And I think there's a thing with after school, every the, the kids that I'm most closely connected with, 
every day after school, there's art class or there's dance yes. or there's hockey or there's right. one thing or five, five days a week right. that they, my kids came home from school and they disappeared. I did. Right. I didn't like it when I had something after school and I right. wanted to come home and right. go into the woods. That's why I like the, um, you know, in Putney they have an after school program that's based in the school forest. Correct. And so that's one of those good ways to kind of take that after school thing in, but actually embed it in the nat you know, natural world exploration. Do the kids really get to play in the woods? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think as educators, it's really, um, sometimes it feels like it's an uphill battle yeah. to convince parents that it's okay that their kids aren't scheduled every minute. Right. And that you're actually giving them a gift to let them be bored once in a while so yeah. that they can develop their own inner resources. And, and there's, you know, once they believe you, there's relief. Right. Like, because they remember what it right. was like to think of their own ideas. For right. them. So, so th this is important for what we're thinking about right. here at Dummerston, at right. the Conservation Commission, that we, the school wasn't having special environmental education programs, so we raised the money to pay for those. Right. Um, but we're thinking about how we raise a bunch of kids as, as our, right. nobody really tells Conservation Commissions what to do that much. Right. And with, how do we raise these kids so that they're going to know how to take care of what we're leaving them with, this, the natural resources in our community. Yeah. And, and so we're, we're thinking about that. So if you have ideas for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Guilford has a nature-based program for preschool. Has, has a nature-based preschool program, right. And my wife does a lot. My wife does a forest day. One of the th interesting things is this whole forest day movement, which is happening. Uh, some around here, more up in kind of central Vermont, but Forest Days is one day a week in the woods. At, uh, for kids in the woods? This is in schools, yes. you know, and so started with a lot of kindergarten teachers doing it, and now some schools are doing it up, you know, throughout the grades. So um, Sharon, Vermont Elementary School does a one day a week in the woods thing. My wife does it with her sixth graders in Guilford. Huntington, Vermont is doing it with all their kids from kindergarten through fourth grade. So that's a, that's a good thing to support. But, the, but the, the after school program that's kind of more uh, woods exploration, woods adventure, mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that would be a good thing for the Conservation Commission to support if somebody wanted to do it. And who's, who runs that program in Huntington? I don't know. I know that who's the, who's the special ed teacher there? Lynn Borowski. Might be. It might be her. Well, and then there's Steve Hagger, there's the uh, farm to table. Right. Right. Uh, his program is wonderful mm -hmm. too. Yep. And there are more and more people who are looking towards um, influencing early childhood. Yeah. I mean, I have a nature-based preschool here in Dumberston at the camp, and then we're doing a professional learning community of people who are more interested in becoming more nature-based, even if they're in a center-based program. Right. And um, and there's there's a, uh, there is a movement, and right. it's it's happening. It's not. Um, I don't feel like it's happening in a vacuum. Right. Most of those people are connected with other people, air fans or whatever. Right. And so um, I think. To, to let people know that there are options, that it's not, you know, they don't have to be in the gym after school or doing right. their homework in an after school program. There are options out there for them to be able to be outside exploring. I have a little guy who goes to Aspire, you know, at, at Dummerson School a couple of days a week, and then he insisted that he still come here uh -huh. um, the other days because he needed to be outside. He needed right. to be in the woods, and, and the kids recognize it if we listen to them. Right. And I wonder also now that some of these nature, pre these nature preschools and kindergarten programs are becoming more pervasive, mm -hmm. that parents will start putting pressure on schools to, to have it to con exactly. continue through yeah. elementary school age. We've done, we've been writing about, like, we've done a case study of a school district in Michigan where that's what happened. There was a big prominent nature preschool, kids went to kindergarten, mm -hmm. parents were complaining, the school district started a nature kindergarten. Parents then start complaining about first grade, they started in nature first grade, now they've got nature second grade. So it's actually having upward pressure into the elementary mm -hmm. grades. It, it, there is a, an option for parents if they want their kids to have a day off a week, 
they can go to the wilderness campus oh, down. Yeah. Down. Yeah, and Oyase is this is oh, yeah. Oyase is doing all the things that I was, you know, that I was right. trying to do with my own kids. Yeah. What is Oyase? Oyase is the Vermont the Vermont Wilderness School program of kids spending a day doing wilderness skills, fire building and it's the, it's four times ten long. Right. It's right. 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 It's, um, it's right near our house. There. I love. I spent a day with them once, and uh, the ten-year-olds are off in a group that's about a half. There's a big campfire, and then the ten-year-olds are in a separate group down about a half a mile away. And so the first task is they got to get the fire going. So there's a whole bunch of kids working on fire making with you know the bow drills and all that stuff, which is really hard to do. Uh, but kids will work at it endlessly. But in case the kids with the bow drills don't, aren't successful, they send two of the 10 year olds, kind of trackless forest, back up to the central fire with a tinder conch. And a tinder conch is like a, a, a birch polypore, you know, one of those, those uh, shelf fungi that grow on the side of birch trees. If you put those in the fire, they, uh, they'll ignite and they'll smolder for a really long time. So they send the kids, two boys with this tinder conch, back up to the main fire so they can light the tinder conch and then bring it back. So this is early May. This is the only time of the year when there's really a high forest fire danger. You know, everything is really dry, right? They've got kids, 10-year-old ten, ten boys on their own, walking through the woods with fire, right? And, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what could, and that's the kind of thing. It's like, the, you know, that's the kind of thing that if you, you know, a school administrator would go bonkers about that. And it's, and it's, you know, giving kids responsibility and trusting that they'll be able to, you know, take it. So, I like a lot of the stuff that the, that the Vermont Women School does. Well, thank you. Thank you.